All right, how many of you like leftovers? You're kind of like one of those, yeah, yeah. You know when I think leftovers are best? I mean, I'm not so much of a leftover person, but when they're good, when I really like them, when I think leftovers are best, or when I am really, really hungry, and then what's boxed up and left over is really, really good. You know what I mean? That's when leftovers are best. It's like I'm, I'm on my way home from work, you know, and I'm just starving, work kind of late. I'm like, oh, I'm so hungry. I don't have anything home to eat. What am I going to do? Uh, this is the single life. I'm not thinking about cooking for my family or anything like that, so bear with me on this one. But, uh, you know, so I, I'm really, really hungry. I go home, I open up the refrigerator, and then all of a sudden I see it. It's that box of leftovers from Dutch's daughter. That's when leftovers are good, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's when they're good. Well, that kind of sums up our message today, believe it or not. But we'll get to that a little bit later. We're in the second message of this new series called Leftovers, and Randy has been on vacation this week, so that's why I'm here. And as he explained last week, though, when he opened up the series, that this, this is a series that's all about our life experiences, what to do with them once they've happened, and they're just kind of left over now. You know, it's about learning the different ways of processing our life experiences with God so that they have meaning and purpose for our lives. So like that, that song said, so that our lives matter. That's what it's all about. And in case you weren't here last week and you're thinking, what is all this stuff about? These are all leftovers from assorted FCF message series throughout the years. So we're just, looks like somebody's basement, doesn't it? Well, today we're talking about those leftover life experiences that need to be boxed up and enjoyed again. Boxed up and enjoyed again. And the portion of scripture that this message is going to focus around is Psalm 42. But before we go there, what I want to do is just sort of give some background information on the book of Psalms because it's, it's quite different from many other books in the Bible. You see, Psalms is a collection of songs and poems and prayers. And these were all meant to be used both in public worship and in private devotions for people. And the various Psalms in this book, there's over a hundred of them, uh, they span quite a long time period. You have some that were written uh, way back in the time of Moses, 1440 B.C., and then all the way up into the Babylonian captivity of the nation of Israel when Babylon had conquered them and taken them uh, captive. Uh, and that would have been around 580 B.C. So it's quite a span of time here. And because we're dealing with such a long span of time, it, obviously there are many different authors or different writers in the book of Psalms. David, Israel's second king, uh, is probably the most famous of the psalmist, of the writers of Psalms. He wrote over 70 of the Psalms. Now, an important thing to understand about the Psalms is that they're not meant to be a narrative of historical events like many of the other Old Testament books, but rather they kind of parallel historical events of their time. It's sort of like they're the soundtrack or the mu uh, musical score to the movie. They, they set the emotional tone of that time. And they bring the historical events that occurred down to these real-life, just personal experiences that you and I can relate to. I mean, it's kind of like this. You could read a, a history book on the Civil War that will give you the facts of the Civil War, or you could read the diary of a soldier who lived through that historical event. And you and I both know we're going to get something entirely different from the latter, from that diary, that personal experience, something that's so much deeper, and again, probably something we can connect to and relate with in some way. Well, today we're looking at the 42nd Psalm, Psalm 42. And I tried my best to get the facts first on this psalm. You see, I wanted to be able to come here and tell you exactly who wrote it, when they wrote it, and what that historical event was that was going on during that time. But in all the things that I read, it just wasn't very clear. As a matter of fact, there were differing opinions on it about who wrote it and when it was written. And Randy was away on vacation, so he was no help you know, like, what's up with this? You're on vacation, I need you right now for some biblical stuff here. Um, so I was kind of up the creek without a paddle. But here's the one thing that, that I came to realize about it all. The one thing we do know for certain about Psalm 42, and it's actually the most important that, thing that we need to know for our purposes here today. Whoever it was that wrote this psalm, and, and whenever it was, and whatever the historical event was that was taking place, the one thing we do know is this. 
The man was in a funk. The man was in a funk. And that's the part that matters most for us today. I mean, have you ever been in a funk before? Okay, nobody's raising your hands and you're human. Come on. You know, you can't be human and not have been in a funk before. How many of you, you've kind of been in a funk pretty recently? You know, how many of you, you're in a funk right now. And that's why I'm not raising my hand because I'm in a funk and I just want you to leave me alone. Everybody who didn't raise your hand, I know that's the case with you. But the thing I've noticed about being in a funk is this. I've noticed that sometimes I know exactly why I'm in a funk. There's no question. This, this, and this got me in a funk, you know. Then other times I have no idea. I'm just in the funk. I don't know why. I'm just there. And here's something else about being in a funk. You see, if we don't do something about it, the funk will turn into a rut. And that's something a little bit deeper. And it's a little bit harder to get ourselves out of. And the thing about a rut is this. If we don't do something about it, the rut can become a pit. And that's something that's much deeper and much more difficult to get ourselves out of. So whether it's a funk or rut or pit, whether we know why we're in it or we have no idea why we're in it, there's one thing that is usually always true of our situation. And it's this. God feels very, very far away. God feels very, very far away. And the writer of this psalm, he was discouraged because he was exiled to a place that was far from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of Jewish life, of Jewish worship of the one true living God. And he was not able to go there, to go to the temple and worship the one true living God and be with him. And then on top of this situation, he found himself, there were these enemies that were kind of taunting him. They were rubbing it in. Where's your God? Ha, ha, ha. Where's your God? And he wondered, too, where is my God? So this is the condition of our psalmist. Whoever he was, he was in a funk. Perhaps it was even a rut moving toward a pit, feeling that God was so far away, so far away. Now, what I think is so cool about this is the fact that the Spirit of God, these thousands of years ago, he inspired this particular man to pin down his thoughts and his feelings exactly just as they were, the raw emotions, the, the, just the thoughts as they were, so that they would be included in the Word of God, the Bible, so that people like me and you could learn from them, could find some help in them, some comfort, you know, People like me and you who also find ourselves in funks and ruts and pits. And so that in doing so, this man's leftover life experiences would matter because we too can learn how to process some of our own. So with that in mind, let's look at Psalm 42. I believe it's on page 556 in those blue Bibles. And we're going to look at Psalm 42. It has 11 verses and we're just going to read through this psalm together. And let's really hear, you know, the psalmist and, and his heart and all this. All right? Page 556, beginning in verse 1. He writes this. He says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears, they've been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where's your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Oh, why are you so downcast, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for how we appraise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember. I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. The God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? 
Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, and there it is again, where's your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, as we read through that, you know, we can, we can learn some things today simply by just observing what the psalmist did in this situation as he was in this funk. You know, we can say he was in a funk. Here's what he did. Clink, clink, clink. Now, if we do these clink, 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 we'll learn something. But as I sat in my office this week and just kind of preparing for this time and all, I started to go down that procedure. What are the things we need to do too, just like the psalmist? And, and what I just felt come over me was a, the Spirit of God speaking to me, not in an audible voice, but just in, in the heart, you know, when you hear it, sense him in the heart. And it was as if he was saying, you know, Kim, I want to make this a lot more personal than that. I don't want this to be some kind of formula. There is no formula to this. This is something more real. It's deeper. And so I, I want to speak to you, Kim, and I want to speak to my people in a very personal way. And the first thing I sensed that God wanted to say was this. Learn that you need me. Come on, come on, folks. Kids, just learn that you need me. You're going to be so much better off if you just settle that one in your heart now. Learn that you need me. You see, the psalmist was well aware of his need. As he explained in the, in the opening words, he said, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, oh God. My soul, it thirsts for God, for the living God. And what he's essentially saying here in this poetic kind of way is that, God, I need you. I need you. The same way that the life of a deer depends upon water, so my life depends on you, God. I'm that dependent on you. In the psalmist, he felt separated from God, and he knew that he couldn't rest until he had re restored his relationship with his God because he knew that his very life, his very life, depended upon it. New Testament scripture says it this way. In Colossians, it says, All things were made through Christ and for Christ. All things. We were made by him and for him. And in Acts 17, it says, For in him, in Christ, we live and we move, and we have our very being only in him. You see, folks, our lives were never, ever meant to be lived apart from a vital, living, real relationship with our creator, the living God. And we desperately need him. Whether we realize it or not, we desperately need him. Jesus uh, says it this way in the New Testament, too. He says, he's the vine, and we're the branches. Now, is that not a picture for us of the connection that we need to have with him? A branch is nothing if it's not connected to the vine. Vine and branches. You see, you and I cannot do this thing called life the way it's supposed to be done so that it matters apart from the one who gave us this life. Can't be done. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I think so many of us, we go most days without this sense of, of our desperate need for God. And you know what? I'm talking about the average Christ follower here. I'm talking about me. I go through most days without an awareness of my desperate need for God. I don't think most of us realize how desperate our need for God is until we're in a desperate situation, right? Isn't that true? But folks, our need, our need is just as great outside the pit as it is inside the pit. It's just that we're not so aware of it. And whether we realize it or not, you and I have a daily desperate need for God, even when our circumstances are not desperate. Many of the writers throughout the whole book of Psalms, I mean, these guys, they just seem to get it. They seem to have learned this truth. And by learning it, I mean living it. You know, we haven't really learned something if we're not living it. And listen to how they expressed their daily desperate need for God through the way that they describe him throughout the book of Psalms. There are all these different verses, and they all begin with this. You are my. You are my. And listen to these. God, you are my rock. 
God, you're my fortress. You are my strength. You're my hiding place, my refuge. God, you are my help. You're my comfort. You're my deliverer. You're my shield, my hope, my strong tower. You are my father. You're my savior. Now, does that not sound like a desperate need? Do we not all need this kind of God? Do we not need him every day if he's our rock and our fortress, our strength, hiding place? Father, Savior, we need him. It's as if, I think all these, the psalmists, you know, again, you put them all together, and over these thousands of years, it's like they're still all together just shouting out in the book of Psalms this one thing, God, you are our everything. You are everything to us. We're nothing without you. You know, they just proclaim together, we need you, God. We need you, we need you, we need you. And because they had learned this lesson, because they knew and they understood their daily desperate need, look what, once again, we see throughout this book what many of the psalmists did. One says, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. But I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of your love, for you're my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. I need to hear it every day. In the morning, reminded of your unfailing love, for I've put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For you, to, to you, I lift up my soul. I mean, what's the pattern we see here? In the morning you guys are sharp in the morning in the morning the one thing we need to do each day before anything else is go and be with the god that we desperately need desperately need the god that our lives desperately depend on whether we realize it or not as the deer pants for streams of water so my soul pants for you, oh God. Learn that you need me, God's saying. Learn that you need me. And then I think the voice of God is just, in the heart of God is speaking out to us too in a personal way and saying something else through this psalm. And he's just saying this. He's saying, get real with me. Come on. You know, I'm safe. Just get Get real with me. BibleStudy.org, it said this about the Psalms again in general. The Psalms express the deepest passions of humanity. We can hear the psalmist's desperate cry, and we also hear his emphatic praise. We can hear him pouring out his soul in confession and also bubbling over with joy. And another commentary said this, the Psalms have a wonderful capacity to capture the reality of our human experience. The reality of our human experience. Now, as I kind of thought about that, I, I kind of had this insight that I thought was pretty amazing myself. Did you like to hear what it was? What I realized is that the psalmist were kind of like the country music artist of their day. You know? I mean, come on. Wonderful capacity to capture the reality of our human experience. Is there anything that does that better today than country music? Nothing. Listen to some of these lyrics, and you'll understand what I'm trying to say. I mean, this is, this is the human experience right here. This is the real deal. These are real country music lyrics. I've got tears in my ears from lying on my back in my bed while I cry over you. That is deep stuff. You know, that's the human experience right there. How about this one? How many can relate to this? I bought the shoes that just walked out on me. <laughs> Serious stuff. And this one, I wouldn't take her to a dog fight even if I thought she could win. <laughs> this is my favorite. All I want from you is a way. <laughs> Deep human experience. I don't know whether to kill myself or go bowling. <laughs> it's a toss-up. Best one of all, Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn, you're the reason our kids are ugly. <laughs> you're the reason our kids are ugly. That's their daddy's genes. <laughs> Deep stuff. And you know, now I understand why Randy loves country music. <laughs> I mean, we all know his passion for country music. 
He tries to hide it, but I hear him over in his office, this darn, 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 you know. <laughs> well, the writer of this psalm, just like all the others, he reminds us of something. He reminds us we're humans, not Vulcans. Anybody remember Spock? The guy with all logic, no emotion. You know, but we're not that. We're not created as Vulcans. We're humans. And we have these things called emotions. And they are meant to be felt and experienced. Oh, we so much would rather just box those up, wouldn't we? And, and squelch them and hide them and put them away, keep them under control. But folks, it's more than okay to express them openly and honestly to our God. Completely honest. As a matter of fact, he wants us to do just that. He's calling out today, come on, get real with me. In Lamentations, it says, get up and cry out. Pour out your heart like water before the Lord. He's saying, don't hold back, just let it gush. Good, bad, whatever, let it gush. Pour it out before the Lord with your God. And that's what we see the psalmist doing in this Psalm 42. He's expressing his emotions to God, and there. And so doing that, he is processing them with God. Processing his emotions with God. Listen, you know, let's go back. He said, my soul is downcast, God. My soul is disturbed. You know, in other words, I am sad and I'm confused. What's going on, God? You know, my enemies keep talking to me. Where's your God? Where's your God? And now I'm wondering too, where are you? Have you forgotten me? What's going on? Getting real with God. And what we see and learn from the psalmist is that sometimes our emotions, particularly when we're in the funk or the rut or the pit, you know, they can just kind of be like those rubber bouncy balls. You know, I used to get them in the gumball machine, the rubber bouncy ball. Uh, my brother and I, we used to love to take those in, in the basement where we grew up. It was all concrete walls. And so you could just fling that thing and just watch it beep, 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 all over the place. Well, you know what? Our emotions can be like that too. We're up and we're down, particularly when we're in a funk. They're all over the place. But that's okay. Because you see, part of processing our emotions and getting ourselves out of the funk is just letting them go and bounce all over the place. Now, I know what some of you all are thinking right now. And it would be the male population in the room that I know what you're thinking right now. And you're thinking, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Women are the ones with the bouncy ball emotions. You know, you should be doing this at a, one of those women's retreats. No. Now, granted, we do bounce a little bit more. I'll give you that one. But you know what? Men have bouncy ball emotions, too. The problem is that you just kind of mask it all under one thing, anger. Don't you? You know, when, when, we know, when you're angry, we know there's a five other emotions going on. But the only one we see is anger. You know? I'm totally convinced that that's what NFL football is all about. <laughs> Whether you play it or watch it, it's just men dealing with their bouncy ball emotions. They all know what else to do. Isn't that true? Yeah. Getting some applauses on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the wives who are, yeah. God knows we are all bouncy balls, and it's no surprise to him. He knows exactly what's going on inside each one of us, all our thoughts, all our feelings. And so he's just kind of encouraging us today. Come on, get real with me. I already know anyhow. Get real with me. Let it out. Process it with me. And if you do that, you're going to discover two things. You're going to discover, one, that it's critical to getting out of the pit. Critical. you got to process Get it out, process it, and that'll be your way out of the pit. Two, it will bring you into a deeper and more genuine relationship with me, God is saying. It's the way out and the way in. The way into a deeper and more genuine relationship with God. I mean, think about it for a moment. Don't you feel much closer with that person in your life who you are just able to be completely open and honest with? You don't have to worry about how you sound, you know, if you don't sound crazy or like you're losing it. That's okay. You can be that way. You know, someone who just knows all your junk and they allow you to just bounce all over the place when you need to. That's the person we feel close to. Why? Because we feel safe with them. We feel accepted by them. We feel understood by them. And so therefore we have this deeper and more genuine relationship with them. And that's exactly what God wants with each one of us. Exactly. And folks, I got to tell you, th this part really hit me personally this week. 
You know, it's so funny how I can be writing going, yeah, this is what God wants to say, and then it goes, Ugh. he just said it to me. Because here's the truth of the matter. If I'm honest with you, seldom do I feel, and I'm talking feel, just feelings, do I feel God's presence. I mean, I know it, and I, I, I live it, but in terms of that experiential kind of thing, like when people just talk about feeling close to God, I don't feel it very often. And I see it in other people, and I actually envy it. I have spiritual envy. You know, I see it in Randy, and I know the closeness that he feels with God. And, oh, so much want that. And I'll pray for it all the time. God, help me to feel close to you. Help me to feel your presence. And here's what hit me. He said, Kim, you're not pointing out your heart to me. You know, I'm getting this nice little boxed up emotional thing. You know, you come to me and you read the word and you pray and, and you know, it gets a little bit emotional, but, oh, we're really safe, you know. Because, see, I'd rather just kind of go through my list of needs, take time to thank him, ask him for some guidance and help, go with me today, and boom, let's just go. And it doesn't get very emotional. I do not pour out my heart to God. I clam up in those times, even with him. And just in my office, I just came to realize there's a big part of the problem. You know, more, if I want to experience more of God's presence and, and, and that sense of closeness, then I've got to be completely emotionally open, honest, and vulnerable with him. That's part of the way into a deeper and more genuine relationship. You see, folks, our God is an emotional God. And he created us as these emotional beings. And so we are meant to have an emotional, emotional relationship with him. Getting, getting emotionally real with God, it's critical for getting out of the funk, but getting into a deeper and more genuine relationship with him. Critical. So God's saying to us, he's saying, learn that you need me. Get real with me. Come on, get real. And then he's saying this, I think. He's saying, remember the goodness that is me. Remember the goodness that is me. Now that one sounds a little odd. So you got to kind of hang on with me for a moment, okay? Because this is the boxed up and enjoy it again part. It's the whole title of our message, so it's kind of important. Okay, so hang with me on this one. But remember when I said at the beginning, when leftovers are best? Right? When are they best? When we are really, really hungry and, and the leftovers we have boxed up are really, really good. And that's the essence of Psalm 42 right there. You see, the psalmist was really, really hungry for God in that moment. So hungry. Desperately wanting and needing more of God in that moment. He used the words, my soul thirsts, but he could have easily said, my soul is hungry for God, for the living God. My tears have been my food day and night. I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. Oh, when can I go and meet with God? So what did he do? Well, he poured out his emotions. He got real with God, but that's not all. He did something else that was so incredibly important. In verse 4, he said this. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. You see, he didn't just pour out the emotions, but he made this choice in the middle of it all to remember. To remember. Or in other words, to open up a box of really good leftovers and enjoy them in this time of need. I'll say that again. To open up a box of really good leftovers and enjoy them in his time of need. To remember. He said, these things I remember. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God. The worship experiences with community and church, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. That's what I remember. I'm going to, oh, I can visualize them. I can see them. I can remember how it felt. Oh, I remember. I remember. So he chose to remember some good leftover life experiences that were given to him by a God who is so good. By a God who is so good. In Psalm 103, it says, I will never forget how kind he has been 
I'll never forget, I'll never forget how kind he has been in the same verse in a different version. It says, may I never forget the good things he does for me. Oh, may we never forget the good things he does for us. What the psalmist did in his pit of desperation is what, what you and I must learn to do when we're in our funks and our ruts and our pits, to remember the good things that God has given us and the good things that God has done for us. Now I'll bet you anything, there's one person here, at least one, who you're thinking, what if I don't have anything good to remember? Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. Let me ask you this. Have you ever gone to the movies and you had Mr. Big Head sit right in front of you? Has that ever happened to you? You know, right in front. You sit down and you're so excited because you got your popcorn and your soda and you're all excited about this movie that you've just been dying to see and then the man with the absolute largest head in the entire theater comes and sits right in front of you. Now I'm talking back in the olden days before stadium seating. Now it really doesn't matter, but you know, the old theater's where it mattered. So even though the screen in the theater is gigantic, it's huge, Mr. Big Head is right here. So the whole movie, and every time he shifts, you gotta shift too, don't you? You get cranking your neck, and you're like, oh, and you never do see the full screen, you know? It's how life is sometimes. It's how life is sometimes. You see, the story of God's goodness in our lives is being blocked out by some big, ugly stuff that's right here. It's way too close. And so we can't see it. We can't see the story of the goodness of God in our lives because we've been boxing up the wrong stuff and holding on to that. You know, we've been boxing up and holding on to the heartache and the betrayal and the if only and that failure, and those disappointments, and the pain, and the sorrow. Oh, and our boxes are so full, and they're right there. And now we cannot see the story of God's goodness in our lives. The movie screen, as big as it is, because of what's right here. Now, fortunately, folks, Randy's going to deal with those kind of leftovers in another message. So if you've got a lot of that kind of stuff boxed up, there's hope. It's coming. And Randy's going to uh, share a lot about those kind of leftovers and what we need to do with those. But for now, you just need to know, folks, in the midst of all the yuck in this life, all the yuck in our lives and are right here, right around us, in the midst of it all, there is good. There is good. Good stuff that our good God is giving to us and that he's doing for us. God's goodness, it's all over the story of our lives. Psalm 16, 2, it says, You are my Lord, and apart from you, I have no good thing. I have no good thing. Singer Amy Grant once sang a song. She put it this way, The one thing I ought to know by now, anything good that happens in life is from Jesus. It's from Jesus, anything good. God's goodness, it's all over the story of your life and mine. And that's why God is saying to us today, remember the goodness that is me. Oh, just remember, remember the goodness that is me. You see, it's about more than just remembering the good stuff that God has given or that God has done. It's about remembering that God himself is good. God himself is is good. Did you know seven times in Scripture, six of them are in Psalms and then one is in Chronicles, seven times there's this one verse repeated, and it says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Do you regularly box up God's goodness and his love so that you can enjoy it later? Bring it out and, and remember it in the times of need, how good God is? So I reflected on that this past week, and, and I just thought about, you know, the story of God's goodness in my life, and I was just overwhelmed because I have boxes that are overflowing when I really stop and think about it. But I don't pay much attention to those, and I need to. 
Because when I really stopped and thought, oh, his, the story of God's goodness is all over my life. There are all these times that he's changed me and he's challenged me. The times he's rescued me and the times he's restored me. The times he's protected me and he's provided for me. He's developed me and he's delivered me. He's forgiven me. He's assured me. He's walked with me. He's carried me. He's held me. And sometimes he's just blown me away with unexpected blessing that I didn't even deserve. Never deserve boxes just overflowing with God's goodness the story of God's goodness in my life life's leftover experiences of God's goodness of his enduring love for me some of our leftover life experiences folks we've got to learn to start boxing them up and enjoying them again This was the psalmist's remedy for surviving and getting out of the funk he was in. And folks, it's our remedy too. We must learn how to do this, and we must also choose to do this in those moments. You see, you and I are not healed from a sickness simply by going to the doctor and get a prescription, are we? No, we've got to go get the prescription filled, and then we've got to take the medicine before we're going to get well. And so it is with this remedy as well. You and I, we must choose regularly first to be boxing up those life experiences of God's goodness. Put them into boxes. And then choose. Choose to open them up. You know, that's usually when we don't feel like it. We, sometimes we like to stay in the pit. We want to stay in our misery. We've got to make a conscious choice to say, no, no, I'm opening up that box of God's goodness, and I'm going to remember I'm going to remember. And when we do that, when we choose to open up the leftover boxes of God's goodness and his love, just like the psalmist did, then something dramatic and powerful happens. Over and over again, the psalmist, he kept saying this to himself, put your, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. And I, and I think God's saying to us today, renew your hope in me. Because that's what happens in those moments. We get a restored hope. Renew your hope in me, God is saying. A theologian that I read said this. He said, what oxygen is to the lung, such is hope to the meaning of life. I mean, what reason do we have to live without hope? How will our lives ever matter without hope? We've got to have hope. And I'm not talking about the kind of hope that's just some kind of wishful thinking. Oh, I really hope so. No, no, no. Biblical hope, the kind of hope that that Christ offers, it's a certainty. It's an assurance. It's something we can count on. We can take it to the bank. And that's why Hebrews 6.10, it tells us that our hope in the living God, it's an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, an anchor for our souls. You know, God's saying, renew your hope in me. You know, as you choose to kind of open up the boxes of those leftover life experiences, renew your hope as you just remember, I am good, and my love endures forever. I will always love you, always, and you can trust me. You can trust me even in the pit. You know, I I think more than just a remedy, though, more than just a prescription for the times we're in a funk. This whole idea of of boxing up certain life experiences to be enjoyed again, well, I think it could also be a powerful uh, preventative measure as well. You know, if an apple a day keeps the doctor away, how about a box a day keeps the funk away? Right? And what if you and I, I mean, what if we were to intentionally start every day boxing up the experiences of God's goodness, you know? What if at the end of each day, that the, maybe we boxed it up by writing it in a journal? Oh, here's the places I saw God's goodness today, or I experienced it, I felt it, you know? Or maybe it's just in prayer to God as we lay our heads down on our pillows, and that's the last thing we do. Let me box up your goodness, God. Let me remember today what you did this day, you know? Or wouldn't it be cool if we did it over the dinner table with our loved ones? And it became an experience where we shared, you know. What do you want to put in your box today? Huh? You know, what if we started at the end of each day? God, I, I caught you today. I saw what you did. Oh, I was watching. I didn't miss it. 
I felt it, and I knew it was you, God. You know why? I knew it was you because it was so good. Oh, it was so good. Anything good that happens in life, that's, that's Jesus. I saw your compassion today, God, when you, and you fill in the blank. You know, I felt your protection when I was about to, oh, and I sensed it was your guidance in that moment when I, God, you just, you just blew me away when you, oh. I did that again intentionally this week, and I thought back actually over the past week, and just some of the coolest moments, I had lunch with a 10-year-old friend, little boy, for his birthday last Sunday, and oh, that was a moment of God's goodness. Best lunch I've had in a long time. God's goodness. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his love, it endures forever, ever, and ever.